Jordan Durstein is an associate pastor at the Meeting House downtown and also a student here at Wycliffe College. And I'm really happy tonight that we were able to get Jonathan Pajot. He's an author, speaker, and artist. And he'll share a little bit about his uh, life and things that uh, he's really passionate about. And we're really uh, honored to have him here today. And so I'd just like to welcome you to tonight. Very good. Welcome, everyone, again, and a special welcome to Jonathan. So, Jonathan, we're, just to put everything in a bit of perspective, now you are an orthodox iconographer, but that is not the tradition you grew up in or where you started, so you are Canadian. Yes, French-Canadian. And you grew up where? I grew up in the eastern townships of Quebec. Very so cool. uh, Sherbrooke, that's where I grew up. But I also moved around. My father was a Baptist minister. And so I lived in uh, Wheaton because he went to study in Wheaton, uh, Wheaton College. And I also lived in Denver where he went to Denver Seminary. And so I, yeah, so I've lived a little bit all around. Very cool. And there's you, Baptist Church, that's where you grew up. That's, that's where right. you're from. Yeah. And then after that... What happened? What happened? What happened? How do you go from a, you know, a Baptist boy, pastor's kid to being, so tell us a little about your story. All right. Well, uh, I always want to blame it on my father, you know, because my father was actually a very thoughtful uh, person, and, uh, you know, I was, I mean, in the Baptist, in the Fellowship Baptist Church is where I grew up. It's very conservative. It's very kind of literal, and, um, but my father was more, he was very thoughtful, and he brought that culture into our house, and was always asking questions. And so we grew up in that atmosphere, my two brothers and I. And so I, you know, when I was a teenager, I was in youth groups and I, I wrote several plays, which we, we did like these tours around Quebec where we would evangelize with these big plays, like 30 people. Jesus music. plays. Yeah, like Jesus plays with music and stuff. But I was, I studied art. I went to school to study painting at Concordia University in Montreal. But I, the whole time I was at Concordia, it was just a huge struggle for me. I did really well in terms of the academic part. I finished first in my program. But the whole time, I, I just was struggling to find a way to match my faith tradition or, you know, growing up in a kind of Baptist evangelical church, which is, which is not fully an iconic. You know, they have, you know, they won't, they won't uh, like they'll have books for children with images of Jesus, but for sure not in the church. Uh, and in general, there, there wasn't imagery, was not part of the tradition. And so I was just struggling to find out how do I match these two, two things together. And it ended up becoming the subject of my work. So all through my undergrad in, in painting, I was basically trying to work out what it meant to be, a first of all, a Christian, second of all, a Protestant, and an artist, all of those things, a contemporary artist uh, as well, bringing all that together. And so I was, I was just struggling. I, was, I came up with all these, these images that I, w I created like this kind of symbolic language where I had different images which would represent different aspects of, of the tradition or the Bible and put them next to each other. I had like the Tower of Babel and the bronze serpent and all these images of human uh, building, but then also falling down. And so anyways, it, it, it was just a huge mess really. And in the last year of my time at Concordia, the very last evaluation, my professor sat with me and she said, first of all, I want to tell you, you've got all A's. Like, don't worry about it. You're, you know, you're fine. And then she said, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm finishing my degree. Uh, and she's saying to me, what are you doing here? She said, you should go to seminary or something because this is just not, it's not the place for you. She was right. She ended up being totally right. It's probably the best advice that anybody had ever given me. I tried to be a contemporary artist. I opened a studio with some friends and we were working and you know, we trying to do that contemporary art thing, but I just couldn't get it to, to match. And at the same time, I was going through the spiritual crisis of feeling like there was something lacking in, the, in what I'd grown up in. You know, in college, I'd read philosophers. I started to look into different mystical traditions of other religions, you know, reading Buddhist texts, reading Gnostic text, reading Hindu text, Sufi text, and thinking, wow, this is amazing. Like, you know, this is so beautiful. This whole transformation of the person, this bringing the person into the, the light of God. I was like, this is just so beautiful. And I thought, why don't we have this? And then I found out that we did actually have that. 
Uh, it's just that I didn't, in my particular mm -hmm. context, we just didn't have it in that particular context. Yeah. And so then I started reading the Church Fathers uh, and just fell in love with St. Gregory of Nyssa, especially, uh, but also St. Irenaeus. Just, just a lot of the, just the early, the early fathers, the Cappadocians especially. And all through that, you know, it was all kind of shaking in my mind. All of this was, 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 was shaking in my mind. Finally, I just destroyed all my art, and I just stopped making art because I, I just couldn't get it to, to jive. And at the same time, I discovered traditional kind of Christian art, medieval art, I would call it. And so if you had gone to a, into a church in the year 1000, if you had gone into a church in Spain or in Armenia or in Syria or in Jerusalem, you would have seen essentially the same thing. You would have not seen exactly the same thing, but you would be able to find your way in the visual representations that you saw there. Visually in terms of the paintings or the mosaics, but also in terms of the way the space was laid out, um, the hierarchical space that, that, that the church was made in. And so discovering that language, I felt like this is what I've been looking for my whole life. This beautiful language that was kind of there, which was a visual semantics. It was like a, an, a visual algebra where you had all these images that had been slowly kind of brought up in the church and were put next to each other in different images to create a language, really, a visual language uh, for Christianity. And so, and then again, I thought like, okay, but why doesn't this exist anymore? Like, we don't have that anymore. It's gone. And then I realized that, no, it, it's still alive in the Orthodox Church. So all of that, the mystical aspect, discovering also hesychasm and uh, the Jesus prayer and just the, the whole... Hesychasm, I'm going to hold oh, you up you're gonna, there. Oh, you're going to on hesychasm. Some, things that some people, like, I don't know what You don't know is. what hesychasm so is. So please, explain. Okay. Uh, so hesychasm is the, is the mystical uh, tradition in, let's say, the, the East. And what it is, it's the... It's a process of, of deification, or their theosis. Theosis, yeah. And so it's, it's the manner in which the person enters and is united to God, we would even say becomes God to the extent that that's possible, hmm. without not being created, without stopping uh, to being a creature. And that process, there's a whole moral aspect to it. There's also a prayer aspect to it. There's repetition of a prayer, there's breathing, there's the heartbeat, there's this whole mystical tradition which, which was very much alive, you know, in the, in the church up until, in the Orthodox Church, up until the 19th, you know, 20th century. You know, maybe communism smacked it a bit yeah. around like all of Christianity, but it's, it's alive now again in Athos and, uh, and in Russia. And so discovering that tradition, I don't know if any of you have heard of, the, of a book called uh, Tale of the Russian Pilgrim, or the Pilgrims, yeah? So that, that book is a, is a very good introduction to, a good introduction to the hesychastic uh, tradition. Um, and so discovering all of that, uh, and then also, you know, just as an artist, seeing not only the painting, not only the icons and the language that was there, but how the visual language of the icons related to the architectural language of the church, mm. related to the liturgy that was performed in that church. And so the whole cycle of feasts during the year, they each have their icon, and those icons are placed strategically in the church according to the directions of the church, according to the hierarchy of the space. So there's this just cosmic language, basically. And what it is, what I discovered that it is, it, it's really like a laying out of the structure of reality in a phenomenological way, in, a, in the way in which we engage in stories. It just lays out this beautiful pattern, just this amazing pattern. Mm -hmm which goes from the singing to the images to the architecture and all of that. And so to me, discovering that was just, I mean, as an artist, as someone who loved beauty, as someone who was looking for a visual language his whole life, I just said, this is, I'm going to make this mine, and I, I, I want this. Like, I just want this. And so then I just started to, to read and read and read and, you know, read modern Orthodox theologians and then read Church Fathers and just kind of, you know, for like two years. <laughs> Without a seminary. No, that's, but, that, but also that, that's also like, that's such a, it's, I was still very Protestant. It's like people tell me like, why don't you just go to an Orthodox church? It's like, no, no, I have to read, I have to read all these things. So I just read and read and read. 
and then finally I was able to get a contact to some Orthodox church, which was in English, and uh, he said, why don't you come? And it was during Lent, and it's what's called a free sanctified liturgy, and it's an evening liturgy, and it's also it's a penitential liturgy. And so during the liturgy, you're like, you're like going down to the ground, like your forehead on the ground, you know, so many times during the whole liturgy, and it's dark, and, yeah. and there's just this whole penitential feeling to it. And I thought, like, I just thought, okay, this is it. Like, I'm home. I, uh, mm. I, this is just amazing. So, so experiential, but also so reverent towards God. And so, so that was it. And then from then on, it was just like a question of time. It was just slowly going through the steps and... Uh, yeah, but when I walked into the church, I, I kind of, I just knew. Yeah. Like the visual language of everything that was there was so... It was, it was more than that. It was just, it was the integration, really. I think it was the integration which I felt that I had been lacking. There's an arbitrariness to the manner in which things were done in the churches where I grew up. Hmm. Whereas in the name of freedom and in the name of also connecting to contemporary culture, there's a, also a banalization of the sacred and a kind of, a kind of um, schism between the form and what is said, between mm. the manner in which we, we worship and, and, what, and, and the fact that we're worshiping God. All of this, I felt, was finding this beautifully integrated thing. Because yeah. what, I, what I come to realize is that things actually do have meaning. You know, things do mean something. In, in our human relation to it. If the pastor in the church is wearing a Roman collar or if the priest is wearing a Roman collar, that means something. It's saying something. If the, but if the, the, the preacher wears a T-shirt and ripped jeans, it's also saying something. And the question is, what are you saying? Hmm. You know, and you can't avoid that you're saying something. You just can't. You, can't. you can't go up in front of people, be the focus of attention of hundreds of people, and the manner in which you comport yourself and the manner in which you look not say anything it will and so so that it's it's that all of that kind of realizing if we're going to do something can't it be connected can't it be connected to scripture can't it be taken from the psalms can't it be brought bringing all of this together hmm. some people don't have that experience i can just say that's what that was my encounter yeah. in the in the in the church cuz i was going to ask you like if you hadn't come on this journey if you had you know that experience that you had right this crazy Lenten service. Yeah. There's this very experiential, very physical too, along with the whole artistic surrounding that you're in. If you had had that 10 years no, I before. Wouldn't have, I wouldn't have seen it at all. I, no. wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to encounter it. Yeah. I think there was just this long process that kind of brought me to that, to that space. But yeah, I, I agree. It's not, yeah. And liturgy is not, it's not easy sometimes. There's a different kind of joy which, yeah. which seeps in. Let's talk about art. Yeah. And the art that you do and how, how that came about. You are an iconographer, sculptor. Yeah, carver. Carver. Say, carver. Yeah. So how... How did that happen? <laughs> how many of those are there here? Oh, uh, I am pretty much the only one in North America, yeah. I would say. Not... There's two, I think, in Western Europe. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is a very... There's not many things where you could be not, like... There's a very niche uh, yeah. thing. That's right. <laughs> like, like one out of ten in the whole world, right? At least. That, well, in Russia and in Greece, for sure. In Serbia, there, okay, there, there's they're, a lot more. There's, they're monks, monks, you know, they're okay. monks doing that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah. So how did that come about? How, so how did that come about? Yeah. So, <laughs> so okay, so I'd thrown away all my art. I just destroyed it, and I'd let go of my studio. And you know, I, I had actually told my wife. I said, I said, I'm not ever going to do art ever again. She probably wasn't happy. I'm about just that. going to be like a normal guy. I'm going to go to work in the morning and that's just going to be it. That's going to be my life. And my wife, she just laughed at me. Like, <laughs> you, 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 you don't know yourself, Jonathan. Yeah. And so when I discovered iconography, when I discovered, you know, the icon and the language, I, I was like, this is it. Like, I've got it. I found it. This is, this is what I'm going to do. This is, this is what I have to do. But the problem with icon painting is that it's very difficult to learn. It's extremely technical, and it's using egg, you know, uh, egg yolks and, and raw pigments, and, and it's very, very difficult to learn on your own. It's almost impossible. Some people have done it, but it's very, very difficult. Can we just pause for one second? Yeah. For anyone who has no idea of what an icon is, oh. could you give a quick What's definition? What's an icon? <laughs> wow, that's going to be a big loop there. Two but sentences. Two sentences? Yeah. Well, okay, so, <laughs> so an icon is a, is a sacred image 
which participates in the liturgical uh, life and prayer life of the church. I would say that that would be the best way to describe what an icon is. I'll give you a few more sentences. All right, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so there is, in the, in the history of the church, you guys are all seminarians, you probably all know this. So in the history of the, of the church, there was a everyone war. He, not everyone here is Not everybody is no. it? Okay. So in the, in the history of the church, there was a war which was fought actual physical fighting um, for images and against images. And so when in the, in the 7th century, after uh, Islam kind of exploded and took up, you know, just all of the East and then all North Africa just in like in 100 years, uh, the, Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire started to shake and one of the reasons it seems that they thought maybe the reason why they were losing all these wars was because Christians had adopted images, um, and the Muslims didn't have images, right? They were against all forms of representation, especially at the beginning. And so that became like a theological question. Should Christians have images? And if so, what are they, and how do they function? How do they function theologically? How do they function in the church? Uh, like, what are they? And so the debate lasted for a century. It was, a, it was, it was rather bloody, actually. And the, but the, the end of it, the, the resolution of it, was an incarnational argument, which is that we do not represent God because God is invisible. If God gives us an image, we represent his image. We represent the image that he gives us. If we don't represent the image that God gives us, then we are denying an aspect of the incarnation. We are... We are in certain ways, pretending that a very important aspect of the incarnation, which is that when you see an image, even if you see an image in a child's book, you can say, your child asks you, hey, daddy, who's that? And you say, oh, that's Jesus. Right? You can do that. And that fact, that ontological fact, which is that there, the possibility that God gave us an image and restored the image of man, which he had created him in his image in the beginning is an aspect of the incarnation it, and so it has to participate in our it has to participate in our life in a way it's almost like an answer to the second commandment it's like god said you will not make images because first of all you can't represent god second of all all these gods are false and the answer to that is the like the answer to all the commandments is christ christ is the answer to that commandment Christ is the image that God gave us, which we were not allowed to make. Mm. And so that becomes the argument for the icon. And so because then, because of that, in the, in the Orthodox Church, the icon takes on a theological aspect. The images become typified. They, 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 they kind of come together, and then they don't change a lot because every aspect in the image has theological import. And so it doesn't, it's nothing, it's not arbitrary. It's not whatever the, the whim of the artist is, but rather it becomes a very precise language which, which has theological import. Mm -hmm. So when you become an iconographer, you have to learn that typological language. You have to learn what the images are, what's in them, you know, how much can I push them on this side or this side? How can I, how can I change them? How, how do they need to be the same? Um, so it's all that that's... That, uh, that an icon is. And then so you, you feel are like that answers your question? Oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> and um, we, as we mentioned, we, we chatted at, at dinner, but you were saying that you'd never have an icon of God. You're not supposed to, though that's people have done it, sadly. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, you think, you think Orthodox people don't get wacky? <laughs> yeah, they get wacky. <laughs> no, they're, they're in the, in the, in the, in the you know, <laughs> Human beings, human beings are just human beings. Uh, things get wacky all over. So in the, in the 14th century, there started to appear on the horizon of art. Even in the Middle Ages, in the Western Middle Ages, you would never see, uh, early Middle Ages, you would never see an image of God. You would always see an image of Christ. If you, show, if you represented the creation of the world, you represented Christ. Christ is shown represent creating the world. You know, if you, every time you show a theophany in the Old Testament, it's Christ mm -hmm. that you show. Okay, because Christ is the locus of the theophany. He is that towards which all the theophanies is, is pointing to is towards Christ. And so the, the incarnational principle makes it so that 
even when we represent the the apparitions of God in the Old Testament, we represent them as Christ, okay? And so if you look at in the Old Testament, that's in the, old, in the Middle Ages, that's early Middle Ages is what you'll see. But then towards the 13th, 14th century, things start to get weird, and then we start to see this image of this God image. And it's like sometimes it's not even clear who it is. Like who is this God? Like it's just a, a, a God in the sky. It's like is it God the Father or is it, is it Christ? Is it God? Like we don't have God. We have the Holy Trinity, like, it doesn't work. And so there's this confusion with this stuff. And you see, the ultimate image of that is in the Sistine Chapel. Like, who is this guy who's pointing at Adam? Is it, uh, it's God? I don't know, like, what's that? Like, who's that? Who's that? I don't know who that is. And so that happened, and uh, then it seeped into the Orthodox Church as well. And so if you go to, if you go to Greece, if you go to Russia, you go to Serbia, you will see, you know, an old bearded man, you know, (laughs) you'll see him. Um, but I think that we have, I think that at least now, there has been a, a restoration, let's say, of the, what I would call the older tradition. Uh, and most iconographers today, except for a few fringe exceptions, they, they don't represent God the Father. Mm-hmm. And they tend to represent the Holy Spirit only in very specific moments, like, uh, you know, at the baptism of Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, sometimes they'll show the Holy Spirit in another place, but they try to limit the, the, the symbolic representation of the Holy Spirit. So, cool. Yeah. Um, for the sake of time, we can talk a little bit about your sculpting, if yep. you'd like, or we can move on to YouTube. Well, I, I'll just explain how yeah, I became please. a carver. It, so I'm wanting to be an icon painter, and I can't find a teacher. I just cannot. There's just no teachers. You know, I'm, I'm kind of like, what do I do? And I'm going to do it. I'm going to the library and spending all day at McGill University looking through books and just kind of learning about these images and taking classes on iconology and stuff. And then my parents, they cut a tree in their backyard, this linden tree. And they said, oh, Jonathan, we hear that this wood, supposedly people carve this wood. So, you know, do you want a, do you want a few pieces of it? And right away I'm thinking, I'm right. going to make a cross. Yeah. I'm going to make, a, I'm gonna make a, a blessing cross. And I didn't have any tools. I had basically had X-Acto knives. <laughs> and so... <laughs> I'm like, how many did you break? I like, oh my goodness! I'm like carving this cross. Even the actual shape of the cross, I carved out with an exacto knife, which now just seems so insane. <laughs> I still have it. I still have it. I keep it as like a sign of my f- original shame. Mm. And so it's like, it's just, <laughs> it's so messed up. It's just like, it's all crooked and I never sanded the back, and it's just really horrible. But so I, I brought it to church, and you know, I, w- I was a catechumen. I wasn't uh, Orthodox yet, and I showed it to the priest, and the priest kind of looks at it, you know, and he says, "Keep going." He's, he's, he's like this severe Russian priest. He's hilarious. <laughs> uh, and so I'm like, okay, all right, all right. So then I get to so my parents. They, again, it was my birthday, and they, like, bought me these tools. So I always say it's my father's fault. I there you go. Him, right? So he buys me these tools, and uh, these little tools, and so I get a panel, and I, and I carved a really elaborate icon. Like, it mm-hmm. took me, like, two months. Just extremely elaborate. It's like Christ in glory in the center, sitting on a throne with, like, a glory of cherub around him and, like, the four evangelists in the corner and then there's the mother, the mother of God, Mary, on one side, and St. John the Baptist on the other. It's like this crazy thing. So I, t- it takes me forever to do it. And then I show the priest again, and he just looks at it, and he goes, keep going. Wow. And so that was it. And so then I just kind of slowly developed it. And, uh, yeah, there's a, lot, there's, there's a lot of detours in there. But finally, one day, I got an order from my bishop and got orders from people. And then it just kind of slowly happened that I became a professional icon carver. If there is such a thing, I guess. I'm, well, there's I'm, very there's few one. of them. There's so at least one. There's full-time one. work, eh? Yeah. Being an icon carver. Who would have seen that coming? I Certainly not me. <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> your YouTube channel has taken off in in very, you know, maybe <laughs> in a very similar, yeah. in a very strange way. So when you started this, what what is your purpose? What is your YouTube channel? What is my YouTube channel? No okay. All right. So, what's going on? So one of the things... That, that I'm telling you about art and I'm telling you about these patterns. And so that became, I would say, even more than icon carving. It became very much like the, the focus of my attention. And studying uh, the patterns, story patterns in the Bible, seeing how those story patterns repeat, and then also how, for example, in the, the architecture of the church and the icons becomes a visual version of the same patterns that are in the Bible. And I was kind of doing this kind of study on my, on my side, and my brother, who, who was growing up with me and had the same questions I did, he was studying 
a lot of rabbinical text. Mm. And he was reading Midrash, and he was even reading Zohar. And uh, he had le- at 16, he had, like, learned Hebrew on his own because he thought, well, if I'm going to be a Christian, I should read the Bible in the original language. There you go. So a r- a learned, true Baptist. There you go. So he just learned Hebrew. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so we're having these amazing discussions, you know, like I'm reading St. Gregor of Nyssa and he's reading Rabbi so-and-so. And so we're talking about the different patterns in the, in the text and uh, it just kind of grew the, our understanding of these patterns. And so at some point, what you realize is that this pattern that's in the Bible and that's in the icons and in the liturgy is, is really is like a, the pattern of reality. It's, it's the pattern of our attention, you could say. It's, it's the manner by which we engage the world. And so once you see that, then you can actually point that pattern elsewhere and you can look at anything. You can look at movies, you can look at novels, and then you can show how the patterns that are in Scripture, because they're the actual patterns of creation, they're the actual patterns of reality, then you can just see them manifest themselves in social phenomena. And and so my YouTube channel, that's pretty much what I do, is I, I talk about two things. One, one side is I talk about popular culture and I try to show these patterns in, in movies and, you know, popular culture. And then the other side is strictly talking about the patterns themselves and showing, for example, taking an image like the tree and saying, okay, let's look at the tree. And then starting in Genesis with the tree in the garden and then going all the way to the tree in the New Jerusalem cool. and then showing how all these images lay, lay themselves out, you know, the staff of Moses and then uh, the, the, the cross. So there's all these images in the Bible. And then I can even show people that there are actually traditions, apocryphal traditions, which will literally say that the tree in the garden was taken out of the garden and then was used to make the staff of Moses, and then was used to make the cross. And so there's these, um, these wonderful, fantastical stories that trace these patterns. And so, and so we don't have to see them as, you know, we don't have to see them as, as kind of historical descriptions of what happened, but what they are is they confirm the, the patterns that are already there by giving us these kind of fantastical stories which link these structures uh, in the text together. And so it's that kind of work that you can do by, by that's one of the wa- reasons why I tell people, read uh, as much apocryphal stories, as many apocryphal stories as, as you can, because what it does is it, it sometimes points dots together that you hadn't seen, but th- they're there in the Bible, but you just didn't notice because you're distracted, because you don't have that focus. But if you start to, if you start to, to see in these other stories, you're like, oh, okay, you can read Midrashic stories. You can, you can read all kinds of stories, and you can see these connections uh, happen because those people thought about what they wrote. These people were, 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 were soaking in that culture. They were soaking in the Bible, soaking in a worldview uh, that was built by, by Christianity. So, yeah, or Judaism. So, so that, anyway, so that's, that, that's what my YouTube channel is about.